Here's what we have left. And that's thermodynamic gas laws, just a bunch of kind of random things that in a weird way are all going to fit together. Random. So today we're going to talk about a couple of things. One being gas laws. But physics approaches gas laws a little bit differently than how chemistry approaches gas laws in terms of units. So it's still your basic ideal gas law equation. Uh, PV equals NRT. Okay? Has anybody not seen this equation? Have you all? If he's sketchy, okay. How do you know? So here's the deal. So this is pressure, right? do we see it in? Now, in if there's ever a physical quantity in science that has an identity crisis, it's pressure. Okay, because it can be measured in so many different things. If you've ever checked, Louis, you've checked the pressure PSI. in your tires. What's that measure? PSI. PSI, all right? Pounds PSI. per square inch. Right? Oh, so, pressure. to give you some perspective on, like, right now, because we have an atmosphere, which is a good thing, or otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation. So, right now, the atmospheric pressure pushing down on you is 14.7 PSI, okay? And everybody has this idea that pressure only pushes down, okay? No, pressure pushes in every direction. If it didn't push in every direction, you wouldn't be able to lift your arm because there would only be pressure pushing down. So it's handy if you visualize, like, for, first off, like what actually creates pressure. So what actually creates pressure is that tiny, 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 tiny bits of matter that we can't see, we can feel when we move our hand through it. But you have these billions upon billions upon billions of oxygen and nitrogen molecules. And the cool thing about them is when they hit, they bounce off. And when they hit and bounce, that creates a force, okay? And that's what we feel is pressure. So because of we're on this rock and on, on a relative scale, if you consider like an apple, and if you cut that apple in half, and that's the relative size of the Earth, our atmosphere is that thin layer of peel around the outside. Okay, That's what keeps us alive. Because space is a horrible thing. You get bombarded with high energy particles, but a meteorite's a horrible thing. If we didn't have that atmosphere, we wouldn't be here having this discussion. And not only does our, not only do we have an atmosphere, it's actually like a nice mix of nitrogen and oxygen. It's about 77% oxygen, about 20, excuse me, 77% nitrogen, 22% oxygen. If that had been reversed, we wouldn't be here having this discussion. Probably because of the fact that if you consider how hard it is to put out fires, okay, oxygen, you have to have fuel for a fire. If, and this is it, imagine you're fighting a fire now and you're at 22% oxygen. If that was reversed and there was a 77% oxygen, any time something got ignited, you would never shut it down because it would just have this huge amount of oxygen available for that reaction to take place. So it's cool that we have this. So because of the fact that we have all these billions upon billions upon billions of particles hitting us and bouncing off, right? That creates a certain amount of pressure. So on every square inch of your body right now, there's the equivalent of having tank pushing down on every square inch of your body, okay? 14.7 PSI. So on every square inch of your body, it's like you have a bowling ball pushing down. On the bottom side, it's pushing up, and that's what equalizes everything so strong. out. This is a lot. Now, to make the units work out in the physics class, Pressure, in a general sense, is force per unit of area. Okay, that's a generic way to look at pressures, force per unit of area. It's pounds per square inch, okay? Now, in physics, we use newtons per square meter, okay? Now, on the conversions, this is why I said pressure has this huge identity crisis. It could be measured in atmospheres, 
ATM. So what atmosphere is your standard atmospheric pressure that we're used to dealing with? Okay, one atmosphere. That's kind of like the benchmark. So right now, we're all under about one atmospheric pressure. So that's also equal to 101,300 newtons per square meter, which is also 101,300 what we call pascals, named after Blaise Pascal, which is the French physicist that came up with it. And that's also to equal to 101.3 <coughs> kilopascals, okay, which is just moving the decimal place over, and we're going from pascals to kilopascals, okay, which is also equal to 14.7 psi, which is also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, which is also equal to 760 tor. Okay. What about bar? Oh yeah, there's there's this is just the most common ones. Okay. Is, there's inches of mercury. There's millibars. There's is, there, is, 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 is bar just atmosphere? Yeah. And then okay. HG. So. From a physics perspective, though, because the fact that we are working in an MKS system, and this is why I always have to think when I give this lecture, is like, is this the chemistry gas law or is this the physics gas law lecture? Same equation, but the units are completely different. So on the physics side, this pressure, because we're in the MKS system, is newtons per square meter, okay? So right now, there's 101,300 newtons per square meter. So if you consider a one kilogram mass like this, okay, which is, and if you round it up, it's like 10 newtons, okay, so this weighs 10 newtons. So imagine that you have one square meter of area. I can visualize that, one square meter. So if I divide this by 10, I get 10,130 newtons, okay, All right? or one kilogram masses. So what this means is that for every one square meter, there's 10,130 of these, the equivalent weight stacked on every square meter. Okay? So it's actually a lot, or 14.7 PSI, it's the same thing. Point being is that there's a lot of pressure on us. But that's cool, we're used to it, okay? We're used to it, it's all right. Don't worry about it, <gasps> I feel it now. Okay, because if you didn't, like we couldn't breathe, okay? We breathe because of the pressure differential. Everybody says, oh, you suck in air. Okay, it's an old adage. Science never sucks. All you do is you create different pressure, pressure differentials. That's all you do. So when you breathe in, basically you're creating a negative pressure, and the atmosphere comes in to fill up that gap, okay? So you really don't suck air in. You just create negative pressure. All right. So that's pressure. Now, volume over here in a physics class has to be in cubic meters, okay? So you got volume in cubic meters. So here's the deal. So if you look at what happens on the PV side, just in terms of units, you have pressure, which is force per unit of area, which is newtons per square meter. Then you have volume, which is in cubic meters, okay? You multiply those together, you get newton meters, otherwise known as joules. Joules. So the left side of the equation actually produces joules, okay? Now, if you're in a chemistry class, it's that pressure is in atmospheres and the volume is in liters. So you get atmosphere liters, okay? In a physics class, you get joules, right? There you go. Now, here's the deal. Then you have N. Anybody remember what N is? Nitrogen. Nope. <laughs> How about the number of moles? Okay. Oh. Right. So this is your old friend moles, right? Okay, mole conversions. Hopefully everybody still has that stashed away somewhere in the dark recesses of your mind from your Chem 1 class. And then you have R. Now that's another thing that has an identity crisis. This is the ideal gas law constant. And it varies depending upon which units that you're in. The idea being is that it's a constant. Now, in a physics class, we're going to use 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. 
Now, the, we'll talk about what the Kelvin means in just a second. That's measured temperature. Is the Kelvin on the bottom? Yes, Kelvin is on the bottom. And it has to be. Because then you end up with the temperature that's in Kelvin here. So then, if you look at what happens, this is joules per mole Kelvin. So then when you multiply it by moles here, the moles cancel out. Then you have temperature, which is in Kelvin. That cancels out that Kelvin. Then you get joules, which is the same thing as you have over here. Okay? So when you look at temperature, so at the end of the day, you have a thermometer. Okay? So there's a crude way, but it measures it. So right now, this thermometer is showing about 22 degrees Celsius. Okay? So what's happening is that there's a pool of liquid down here, and it has a certain amount of kinetic energy, and that kinetic energy, if you think about it, is like second graders named Timmy, right? And we're going to explain gas laws with second graders named Timmy, okay? So you got a classroom full of second graders named Timmy, and they have some overflow energy, so the teacher sends them up here and says, hey, kids, you got too much energy, you all just need to go away, right? So the teacher sends them out of the classroom up into the hallway, right? Now, imagine that the room mom shows up, and she's going to give everybody Skittles, okay? So the kids have Skittles. So what's going to happen to the energy inside the room? It's going to go up. Teachers go, whoa, 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 whoa. Y'all have too much energy. I want to send even more of you out into the hallway. So when I do that, and I hold this with, between my thumb on my index finger, the temperature is climbing for 22 degrees. Now we're up to like 25 degrees. Now we're up to 26 degrees. Now we're up to 27 degrees. So at the end of the day, here's what's happening. So my body is giving thermal energy in the way of photons, okay? And you think, wow, photons are light. Well, photons are any type of electromagnetic radiation. It's also in the form of heat. So basically, and now we're even up to like 30 degrees Celsius. So we went from 22 degrees all the way up to 30. So what's happening on an atomic level is that my energy is flowing into that system. And when it's flowing into that system, it's giving those particles more and more energy. So it's like giving second graders Skittles. And the teacher goes, whoa, I can't deal with you all in this room. You have too much energy. So basically, now we're even up to 31 degrees. So now the temperature has climbed because the room, the teacher has said in the room, y'all have too much energy. I need to send more of you out into the hallway. So as we send more and more out into the hallway, that's going to occupy more space, and that level is going to go up. So what we have basically done as human beings is that we took glass like this, and we arbitrarily took marks, and we put them on the glass. We said, what are we going to call these marks? So we have three primary temperatures that we use, and here's the old joke. Fahrenheit is what human beings feel, okay? Because we we actually have, we are so good at measuring temperature that we can detect the subtle differences between like 72 degrees and 70 degrees, 72 and 70 Fahrenheit. Okay, we can detect that temperature. So Fahrenheit is what humans feel, okay? Celsius is what water feels. Because water freezes at zero, zero and boils at 100, 100 right? And again, that was, so literally, this is what they did. They had a deal like this, they put it in, they noticed the point at which the temperature froze, they made a mark, and they said, okay, we're going to call that zero. So what they did, and they took that same thermometer, and they put it in boiling water, and they said, oh, the point where that water boils, we're going to make that the top mark, and we're going to call that 100. Then we're going to divide everything else in between with 99 marks, and we're going to call that 1 degree Celsius. Okay? It's kind of smart. So Fahrenheit is what we feel. Celsius is what water feels. Kelvin is what atoms feel. Okay? So the Kelvin scale is named after Lord Kelvin. And he had this concept of what we call absolute zero. So this concept of absolute zero, basically it says absolute zero is at which the point, the entropy of an atom goes to zero. Entropy is a measure of the disorder, how how 
random things are. So basically what he says is if you keep cooling things down further and further and further and further and further and further and further, and further at some point the entropy of the atom is going to go to zero. And that's what he called zero Kelvin. So zero Kelvin is like a theoretical value. You can, the beauty of Kelvin is that you have two things going for it. Number one, it never reaches zero. Number two, it's never a negative value. Because mathematically, this is why, this is why, if, there, if there's anything you listen to me in terms of what you're going to do with this. First off, where'd my thing go? I just had it. For the love of all things. How did I lose a pen that I just had? Turn back the tape. Yeah, we just recorded. <laughs> you can't see it. No. You can't see that. Oh. Can you find it? Yeah, this is the reverse. reverse thing. Huh? To buy the thermometer. Who rose the death? Somehow this is Pop's fault. <laughs> this is, yeah, it's definitely his Pop, this is your fault. I don't know why. Let's see if he really watches this. Give him a code word. Give him a code word he has to say when he comes back. Kelvin. Kelvin is the code word. Kelvin is the code word. Kelvin is the code word. He doesn't say Kelvin like by Friday. I'm just not, I have, we know. This is just the weirdest thing. Call it. Call it. <laughs> I kind of have to have it to keep teaching. It's right there. It's right on the It rolled underneath my, okay, it rolled underneath my ah. computer. Okay, Mr. Saul, we found it. It couldn't have gone that far. Okay. It didn't. So, and this is on this conversion sheet here. Okay? So, if you want to go from Celsius to Kelvin, it's on here somewhere. I never know where it is. Basically, you take your temperature in Celsius, and you add 273 to it. So, right now, this room temperature is about 22 degrees Celsius. We add 273, and we get 295 Kelvin. So there's two primary reasons why that temperature is measured in Kelvin. First off, the left side of that equation, the pressure volume side, has to be a positive value, okay? And it can't be zero, right? So if you have a temperature that's in Celsius, it's very easy to get zero degrees Celsius, okay? Wintertime in Kansas, we hit zero degrees Celsius all the time, okay? We have days where we won't go above freezing, okay? So we avoid zeros because if, this si if that temperature goes to zero, that means the right side of the equation is gonna to go to zero, which means either my pressure or my volume goes to zero, which doesn't make any sense. Worse yet, if we go below freezing and we have negative 5 Celsius, okay, well, that's cool. Great. How do you get a negative pressure or a negative volume on the left side to make the signs work out? It's train wreck, okay? So this is why you always, always, always have a temperature that's in Kelvin. It's never given to you in Kelvin. You just have to do the conversion, okay? Just the, the most important thing. Okay, so if you look at the units, you've got pressure, which is newtons per square meter, times the volume in cubic meters, which is going to equal moles, times joules per mole Kelvin, times Kelvin, the Kelvins cancel out, the moles cancel out, I get joules, over here I get newton meters, voila, both sides of the equation work out to be joules, okay? In chemistry class, I would say, voila, both sides of the equation will work out to be atmosphere meters, okay? But because I'm in a physics class, and it's a gas law lecture in a physics class, we get this. So, the equation itself is pretty simple, but typically what we do is we compare things, okay? So let me give an example. So give that a spin over here. So the beauty of gas laws is that you all intuitively understand gas laws, okay? So, what I want to do, give it a spin. Give it a spin. Come on, man. You see that? Yeah, you're good. Okay? So, I've got a balloon 
inside this chamber. Okay, it's just taped to the top of it, right? So at the end of the day, what's giving the balloon its shape? Our pressure. Air pushing on it. Now what, but what's the air pushing on it? What's happening? Oh, it, it wants pressure. to escape. The internal pressure. But what's creating the internal pressure? The air molecules inside. Okay, so two, there's two words I hate. Air molecules. <laughs> Particle. There is no such thing as an air molecule. It doesn't exist. Air elements. <laughs> Particle. How about molecules of nitrogen and oxygen? I knew what you meant. It's just, it's just annoying. Air molecules. There's no such thing. Atmospheric air molecules. Air okay. So there's little particles. Gas particles are bouncing around, right? Okay. Inside the balloon, and that's what's giving it pressure. We also have pressure on the outside of the balloon, right? So what I want to do is I'm going to remove the air molecules that are inside the chamber. Okay. So I'm going to decrease the pressure inside the chamber. So three things can happen. The balloon gets bigger, the balloon gets smaller, the balloon just stays the same size. It's bigger. Just bigger. Why? Because the the air molecules on the inside have to equal the pressure. I'm oh, sorry. The air the gas particles on the inside must equal the pressure from the gas particles pushing from the outside. Okay, so the particles on the inside are still gonna be bouncing around, right? Yeah. But you won't have the outside ones to mediate and balance that. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay? So let's see what happens, and we'll see if they make first. They put the switch. Here. We should put that thing over. We should no, over the pot smaller when it comes back. Oh, it's getting bigger. Crank them, John. Crank them, John. You're right. You're right. Whoa. Uh, oh. Can we put a marshmallow in there? Can you put the tennis ball? Can you put a tennis ball in there? Put a tennis ball in there. Ah, marshmallow wood. Okay. So. It explodes on the inside. The volume got bigger, right? <laughs> Did we change the number? Now this is where you can look at this in terms of like a classroom of Timmy's. Okay. Did we change the number of Timmy's inside the classroom? No. No, stay the same, right? Did we change the temperature of the system? No. No. But what we did is it we we allowed the classroom to basically get bigger. Okay? Volume got bigger. So as the volume got bigger, what happened to the pressure? It got smaller. 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 So if you consider pressure being, imagine me teaching second graders, horrible thought. And I'm in there, and these little second graders are running up, and they're bouncing off of my legs, right? Little ankle biters. Kick them. <laughs> and so imagine, if you will, that we're in, like, in this confined little room, and I'm with all these second graders. This is where I can't this. Okay? I can't handle this. So when I say, okay, we're going to move to the auditorium, kids. Okay? So I take my, my cadre of little second graders, and now we're going to move down to the auditorium. It's like, go, run, be free. Okay? So what's going to happen to the number of collisions with my ankles? It's going to decrease. It's going to decrease, right? I didn't, I didn't give the kids Skittles, right? Didn't do that. Anything like that. I just made the classroom bigger. So therefore, I'm going to have fewer collisions with my ankles. So here's what I want you to see. This is an inverse relationship between pressure and volume, right? One goes up, the other one goes down. So this is actually why, if you, this is where historically gas laws play a part in World War II. So if you know anything about World War II, the United States and European theater used two primary bombers, B-17s and B-24 Liberators, okay? Both of those were open frame airplanes, okay? They weren't pressure, they didn't have pressurized cabins at the time. So they had the windows open, okay? So as the planes flew to a higher and higher and higher altitude, what do you think happened to the pressure inside the plane? Increased. Down. Went uh, down, right? So imagine same. that you're like on a pyramid, okay? A, you're like a cheerleading pyramid. As you go to the top, what happens to the number of cheerleaders that are above you? It gets less. It gets less. It becomes smaller, right? So there's less 
particles to collide with you up above, okay? So as you go, and if you've ever experienced this, if you've ever flown, or even if you've driven up into the mountains, okay, you, your ears sense a, a pressure differential, right? So on the bomber pilots, on the crews, imagine this is, that balloon is their intestines, okay? So they would, for, they regulated the diets of the bomber crews. Wouldn't let them eat beans. Why? What do beans do? They expand. Well, they give you gas, right? Oh, yeah. uh, so imagine you're at 30,000 feet trying to fight off Germans and flak and everything else, and that becomes your intestine. And it expands. And you're going to be doubled over in pain. Okay? And so this is why. They would not let, they regulated the diet of the bomber crews to minimize that exposure. So, now, if I open this up, what's going to happen? It shrinks super fast. Okay. So, what happened is Mother Nature goes, Oh, I need to equalize things out. So Mother Nature has all of these billions upon billions, billions of nitrogen and oxygen molecules, and they go rushing in because there was a pressure differential between the two. So mathematically, there's all these different laws of gases, Boyle's law, Charles law, Avogadro's law, all of this stuff. Okay? But typically what we're going to do, if you look at PV equals NRT, Typically, what we're going to do is we're going to keep the, the number of moles the same, and we're going to keep R the same, because that's a constant. So if I move this over, I've got P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. And this will allow you to solve probably about 95% of all gas law problems. Okay, it's called the combined gas law. So here's all you have to do. If you look at this situation, I don't care what the temperature was, I didn't change the temperature, okay? It just stayed the same. So as long as my temperature stays the same, I don't worry about that. So I cover up the ones that are staying constant, okay? So if you look at what's going to happen here, I had a certain amount of pressure, right? Right? And I had a certain amount of volume, okay? So this mathematically multiplied together is going to give me a number. Okay, I don't know what it is, it's just going to give me a number. It's just going to be a number. Boom, here it is. Now, this side over here then has to equal the same number over there. So, when I hooked it up to the vacuum pump, what happened to the pressure inside that vacuum? Decreased. Decreased. So, the pressure became smaller. So, to balance it out, then what had to happen to the volume? Increased. Increased. Boom. There you go. Okay. Now, you can do the same thing with a syringe, okay, which I happen to have. So imagine this. I'm going to put my finger over the end of it, and I'm going to push down on that. What do you think is going to happen to the pressure inside that syringe? Increase. It's going to increase, right? So imagine that this is me. So here's my normal classroom, okay? I've got my little second graders so running around. Hi, Mr. Berkey. Go away. Okay? And then all of a sudden, they go, hey, Burkamp, we need you to teach you in a much smaller classroom. Oh, hmm, okay? Now, what's going to happen to my pressure? Your ankle. It's going to go much higher because I'm going to have a lot more collisions. Okay? Louis. Why can we just disregard temperature if temperature changes? No, no, no. We're assuming temperature is constant. We'll deal with the change in temperature in okay. just a second. Okay? Now, speaking of temperature. Let's say I've got this syringe, and I take this syringe, and I put it in cold water. So if you imagine the second graders, Skittles is like a reflection of temperature, okay? I take the second graders, and I put them outside on a very, very cold day. What's going to happen to the movement of the second graders? Decrease. To so a decrease. So what do you think is going to happen to the pressure? Decrease. decrease. It's going to become less. So if you look at this in terms of, let's say we're going to keep the volume the same, 
So if you look at P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. So let's keep the volume the same. Okay? So let's not worry about a change in volume. Okay? Same size classroom. Same size syringe. Okay? So then if I cross multiply, I get P1, T2 equals P2, T1. T1. Okay? Anybody have, like, anybody have a car with, uh, like, a, the alarm goes off and your tire pressure gets too low? Yeah. Okay? Mine is fine. Okay? <laughs> Usually what happens is that you can, on a cold, the first cold day, what you typically do is you'll get, and this would happen in my car, is that I got, a, I got a low pressure sensor when it got really, really cold. Why? Bingo. So here's the deal. Because pressure, remember, is a, is a reflection of either the number of collisions or the energy of the collisions. Okay, that's what it is. So I had a certain pressure, right, at a certain temperature. So if I drop the pressure, excuse me, if I drop the temperature because it gets really cold outside, well, then what has to happen to the pressure? It also has to drop. Okay? Now, the other side of it is temperature goes up to 110 degrees. Oh, temperature goes way up. Guess what has to happen to the pressure? Goes way up. Pressure goes way up. Because I, temperature is like Skittles. So increasing the temperature is like giving the second graders a bag full of Skittles. You're going, we've got Skittles! Okay? And they flip out, and they start running around, and the pressure goes way up. Okay? So if you just, you can literally do all of gas laws with second graders named Timmy. Okay? Hey, temperature goes up. You gave Skittles to Timmy. Hold on. More pressure, right? We shrink the size of the classroom. Cool. Okay? You're going to have more pressure. If you think about it that way, it's pretty easy to understand gas laws. Okay. Now, bring yonder camera to the back. Yonder camera. Yonder camera. This is like two hours. Two hours. Two hours. Two hours. Two hours. Two hours. That should be our t shirt, Mr. Burke Camp. It is the coolest thing. It's so cool. Oh, I've won it's like a lightsaber. Yeah. I highly recommend one. <laughs> For a Christmas present? Okay. I'm not allowed to have an Huh? What? Pop's not here, bro. We can, we can say okay. Is it pop a pyro? So, pop the pyro. if you look at the same idea of second graders and skittles, okay? So I'm going to take this piece of metal, I'm going to put it in the flame, and do you think metal expands or contracts when it warms up? Expands. Expands, right? So we put this in here. But what you'll notice. Okay. Sam? I forgot to take the test with me. So I got this, and notice that it's curling, right? Because what happens is that these, this is actually two different metals glued together. And different metals have different expansion rates. So what happens is that as I heat that up, the metal on the outside is expanding more rapidly than the metal that's on the inside. And that's why it curls in this direction. So this is, before they have digital thermometers, this is how thermostats used to work. There, if you've ever seen, maybe you have one in your house, it's like, like a little slider thing, okay? So what would happen is that inside your, therm inside your house, inside that thermostat, there was a piece of metal that had two different layers of metal glued together. So as the temperature in your house changed, that would change the pitch of this metal. And then what it would do is that, because it's metal, what it would do, depending upon where you put the slider, then it would come in contact with that slider that would complete a circuit that would tell the furnace to kick on. So if it's too cold, oh, the furnace kicks on and warms up. So then as the house warms up, then that metal would bend down. It would lose contact with the slider. It would, then the circuit isn't complete. It shuts off the furnace. Okay? Same thing is going to happen 
if on the cold side or the hot side. It's either going to expand or contract, and that's going to change the pitch of this. So the point, here's what I want you to see out of this, is that different metals have different expansion rates, okay? Depending upon the metal, it could expand slowly, it could expand quickly. Oh, now, no. this happened in the past work. So this is designed where this fits just inside of that gap, okay? So I'm going to take this and warm this up quite a bit. And so when you have volume, it actually expands in all directions. So I'm warming this up. And obviously, the, what do you think the relationship is between temperature change and expansion? Is it a direct relationship or an inverse relationship? Direct. Direct. Why? Because it doesn't shrink when it gets hard. Yeah, and the more you heat it up, the bigger it gets. The more it expands, right? Yeah, hotter it gets, okay. the bigger it is. So now, if I take this, and now that won't fit into that gap because of the fact that it expanded so much and it was such a tight machine fit that it won't fit. But if I cool it down, and then remove that thermal energy, then it fits back in there again. Okay. Now, the same thing is going to happen here on this. Okay? So that's a very, very tight fit. So I'm going to warm this up. Stop singing into the camera. Ma. Ma. He's serenading Are you really? Yeah. What? Are you serenading Pop? What does that even mean? Singing to him. Oh, no. no I was going to say, I, mean, I never heard anybody You've never heard of the term serenading? No. no. I've heard of the term serenade before, but not serenading. Yeah, serenade. Okay, yeah. yeah. so now I've got this pretty yeah. warm again. Yeah. Or a grenade. Right. So now, Ooh. it works. It'll fit in there, but it's a much tighter fit than what it was before. Mm. Okay? Not too hot. So, let me cool this back down again. Cool it down. Cool the torch down. So now I want to heat up this side. Okay? Now I'm going to heat up this side. Yeah. So I'm going to heat up this side. Definitely. So once I heat that up, will this still fit inside of it? No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Oh, no. It no? So why not? Well, if it expands like on the inside. Okay, so you're thinking it's going to expand and it's going to make it that. It expands in all directions. It expands in all directions, so it won't be able to fit that in. The okay. Japanese. All right. So here we go. She's done this before. She's going to buy that. She's going to buy that. She's trying to say. Nice and warm. I'm going to put this way. Not only does it fit, it actually fits easier. Easier. What? Okay. So the hole actually got bigger. Now. I see a paper airplane. Sorry. Okay. And here's the reason why. Intuitively, you would think it should get smaller because it's expanding in all directions, right? Here's the best way to think about this. Imagine that that metal was in there. Okay, so in other words, I imagine I hadn't cut out that metal. And that still was there, and I heated it right from the middle. What would it do? I'll expand, expand out. outward. It would expand outward. outward. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the easiest way to visualize this. And if you've ever tried to take any type of substance and, like, compress a round object and try and make it smaller, horribly difficult to do. It's much easier to make that get bigger. So when things expand, when you have metal like that, you, you intuitively almost think, well, it should get smaller. In reality, it gets bigger, because the easiest way to understand that is to imagine that that metal was in there. We heated it up, then we cut that out. Oh, yeah, that would leave a bigger opening, because it's going to expand outward from that. Got it? Good? Great? Got it. Got okay, it. back we go. All right, let's go. POV. POV lightsaber battle. POV. Z -z -z. Yeah, we won. Oh. The viewers at home won. All you had to do was light them on fire.
Then it'd be longer. Could light me on fire, or what? All, only if you're on only if you're down. You're down, I'm down. Uh uh uh. Holla at me. So many beats. Holla at me. Can, Ooh, can you grab assignment? the wire? Thank you. Oh, is our assignment today just over this? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Easy assignment day. Mm. Oh, it's hard? Okay. It's hard then. It's not bad, let's put it that way. Well, this is, this is indeed indubitable. All right, so down here below, and I've got these handy-dandy little equations, and I will give these to you. So what these are are what's called the coefficients of linear expansions. And so basically what this tells you is that how much it changes, and it's a weird unit. Okay, because the units are just Celsius to the negative one. So notice that it has no length to it. It's not centimeters, it's not inches, it's not feet, it's not kilometers, it's not light years. Okay, it's just per degree Celsius. So if you look at this equation, that L equals L naught times one plus alpha delta T. So this is why the units work out like they do. So this alpha is that coefficient of linear expansion. So if, let's say, for example, you have brass, this is what we just did. Okay? So it's not angular acceleration? No, 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 no. L no. is length? And what is and the I? L is length. What is, what is, what is the I? This is not <laughs> angular momentum. <laughs> what is, the is that an I or a one? It's a one. That's a one. It's on your sheet. He doesn't write it's lowercase L's. Well, he did on the test. I, then, really, okay. I noticed it. <laughs> I did too. Like, so this is time. 19 times 10 to the negative 6th, and it has units of Celsius to the negative 1. Okay? So here's how this works so, out. So this is going to be 1 plus alpha. Now, here's the deal. Notice that that is change in temperature. It is not the temperature. Okay? It is the change in the temperature, okay? It is, I emphasize again, it is the change in the temperature. So this only works if the temperature changes. If the temperature changes, there's no new L, okay? So this only works if there's a change in temperature. And clearly, the bigger the change in temperature, the, new, the bigger the length is going to be. Now, here's an interesting thing that happens. Let's say we go from 10 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius, okay? Change in temperature is going to be 10 degrees Celsius. Now, here's the odd thing, and this is why we use Kelvin again. 10 degrees Celsius would be 283 Kelvin. 20 degrees Kelvin would be 293 Kelvin. So that change is also Kelvin. So 10 degrees, a change in temperature of 10 degrees Celsius is the exact same as 10 degrees Kelvin in terms of the change. Just won't be negative. Yeah, cool. exactly. And then, sorry, is that is alpha a constant? It will be depending upon what the material is. Which is these, uh, the charts. Yeah, okay. so like cool. brass, 19 times 10 to negative okay. 6. Gotcha. Okay, So for example, you know that glass and Pyrex, notice that those are, those are very, very small, which means glass doesn't change a lot, okay? But here's the cool thing. If you look at iron and if you look at concrete, notice that those have the exact same coefficients of thermal expansion. This is what allows us to use steel to reinforce concrete. And rebar? Yeah, okay. because that way when the expansion happens, it expands and contracts at the same rate. Because imagine, like, you remember what we saw back there when we had, like, the, the, the different types of metal yeah. and how much that curled? Imagine that steel and concrete expanded at different rates. It would just tear it apart, okay? So one of the cool things that worked out as us as human as civilization was that, and it was it isn't like we had it planned, and it was like, oh, yes, let's make steel and concrete have the exact same thermal expansions, okay? We just got lucky.
that those were the exact same values, because if they weren't, we could never reinforce it with concrete. Okay, so let's say that your L naught, let's say you're talking like piece of metal two meters long, okay? Boom, two meters. And let's say that you have a 10 degree change in Celsius. So this is why alpha has the units that it does. And this is why whatever your length is, is whatever your new length is going to be. Because this is why when you take Celsius to the negative one times Celsius, the Celsius cancels out, okay? So this has, inside of there, it has no units. And then I'm multiplying that by meters, and then it has units of meters. Mm -hmm. So this is why it has kind of the weird jacked up units that it does, because of the fact that this has no units. This is why it works for anything, whether it's inches, feet, meters, kilometers, it doesn't make any difference. Because whatever units you have out on the end is whatever units you're gonna end up with for that length, okay? Now, clearly, if there's no change in temperature, what, what's the value of, in, of what's inside that bracket? Zero. Well, it's one. It's just one, okay? Because if I have no change in temperature, and that's zero, I multiply that by alpha, I still get zero. Zero plus one is one. One times my L naught gets me my L. L, okay? So that's why it has to be a change in temperature and not the temperature itself. Now, there's two versions of this. You have delta L equals L naught alpha delta T. So basically, the reason that you can rearrange this is because delta L would be L minus L naught equals L naught alpha delta T. So that would be L equals L naught plus L naught alpha delta T. And then if you factored out your L naught, you'd get one plus alpha delta T. So it's the exact same equation. It just kind of depends upon the situation. Okay, but literally it's, a, it's just how you want to work the problem. Now, down below, you have area equaling area naught times one plus two, two, two. That's horrible. Come on, erase. Oh, go away. Okay. So, on terms of area, why do you think there's a two there? It's area base times height. Yeah, area has two dimensions to it, right? Base times height. Boom, there you go. So, again, this area, and it doesn't make any difference what that area is. It could be in square meters, it could be in square centimeters, it could be in square inches, it doesn't make any difference. That new area is going to be whatever those units are in. It doesn't make any difference. Now, notice on volume. Here's the pattern. Volume equals 1 plus 3 alpha delta T. Why does that have a 3 in front of it? Length times what times height. It expands in three dimensions. Okay? There you go. Now, on your... Purple sheet. Okay? Now we've got to delve into the purple sheet. Okay? If you haven't ever dug out your purple sheet, Change of an this error. would be the time. End of an error. I don't even know if I can. Purple sheet. Mm -hmm. It's the beginning yeah. of an era, Louis. What? That's what I'm saying. Wait, what purple sheet? The equations the, for physics it, 2. You got it. You just probably threw it away. I don't know. Because you thought no. it was an assignment. You thought it was an assignment. Here, I've got an extra copy. Uh, let me. Let, let me. He wants to. I'm going to take it anyways. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, let me look. So the thermodynamic sections is technically in physics too. Yes. Now, so let me explain what this, this is kind of a cool equation. So this Q, when you see Q, and we're going to see Q a lot, is the measure of thermal energy. And it's going to be measured, any energy is going to be measured in 
joules. So this is going to be joules. Time is, delta T is going to be seconds. So what do you get when you divide joules by seconds? Kg meters per second. No, no, no. Wait. Joules per second. Joules per second. I'm sorry to say. Watts. Watts. Okay. Ah. So this is, this is basically energy flow. Okay. This is the energy flow across like in medium. Now, this is good. So imagine that you have a wall, right? So on this wall, and I can never remember the page number, page 385. Wait, so is T time or temperature? In this? T or is this temperature. is temperature. That okay. one on the bottom is time, though. The small one oh, is time. Gotcha. So somebody, well, hold on. Where's my book? How did my book disappear? Here? Is no. It? The book pop. It's got it. And I swear to God, if Pop has my book, I'm going to kill him. It was. Use your, use your elephant oh. stick on No, no, no. I need, like, the, I need, like, my actual book. Pop, pop, pop. Or somebody's book. Give me somebody's book. Okay. Oh, yeah. If he has, if he, honest God, pop. if he has my The book, new code word is dead. Not <laughs> <something anymore. laughs> okay. So on page 385, it lists all these different materials, yeah. and it has the value of K. So like, for example, silver, Whoa. and it has some jacked up units when you look at it. Wait, K isn't Kelvin? No, this is lowercase K. Oh, yeah. Uppercase K is Kelvin. This is lowercase K. Was this was okay. constant? So that's this 420 watts per meter Kelvin. And you think, well, that's some jacked up stuff. It really is. But this is where the magic happens. Okay? So what this lowercase value of K represents is basically how easily energy flows no, easy through the medium. Okay? Which is basically how easy do photons transfer energy through the medium. So obviously, if you want, like for example, your cooking pan, right? You want that to transfer energy very easily so that when you fry your egg, okay, oh, it gets hot, right? Yeah. Now, but if you have your house, you don't want your house to transmit energy very easily. Yeah. You, if it's cold outside and you want it warm on the inside, you, you want to mediate that transfer of energy. So sometimes you want thermal energy to transfer very rapidly. In other situations, you don't want it to transfer. So here's the deal. So if you look at this in terms of units, so this gets weird, but in the end it works, okay? So you have K, which is watts per meter Kelvin, okay? So that's uppercase K Kelvin. Now, area is the area of the wall, which is going to be in square meters, then you have your change in temperature, which is the temperature gradient from one side to the other, okay? So like today, if, if you look at the outside temperature is about zero degrees Celsius, the inside temperature in here is about 22, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's change in temperature is going to be in Kelvin. And L is the thickness of the wall. So that's going to be in meters. Now over here, we get joules per second which is the same thing as what. So now, Q, look what happens. Q is work? No, Q is thermal energy. Q, okay, Q is what we're, okay. Yes, okay. So look what happens with the units. So this meter is going to cancel out one of those meters. That meter is going to cancel out that meter. That Kelvin is going to cancel out that Kelvin. Voila, you get watts, okay? Same thing. That's why it has some jack that's why it has some jacked up units. It works. So look at the ramifications of this equation. Okay? So think this through. If you want a well insulated house, you want to reduce your thermal energy flow. Okay? So, what you, you, so if your house is warm, so if, if you have a very, very low thermal energy flow across that barrier, then oh right. 
So you get it warm, then it stays warm. You get it cold in the summer, it stays warm. Whatever. What? So area is going to be the size of the wall. You can't fix that. Okay, that's the size of your wall. There's no variation you can have on that. Your change in temperature. So think about this. If your temperature on the inside of your house and the temperature on the outside of your house are the same, are you going to have energy? Or are you going to have any energy flow across that? No, by the nature, it doesn't gain anything from it. Okay. So if your change in temperature is zero, then there's no energy flow per unit of time. Okay, makes sense. L is the thickness. So think about this. As if you build a house with thicker walls, you're going to be dividing by a bigger value. So what's going to happen to your flow of energy? Be less. It's going to be less. So the thicker it is, the harder it is for that energy to flow across that medium. Mm -hmm. So, and then K is going to be a value based upon that material. So here's the deal. If you want to reduce your flow of energy, do you want a K value that's small or a K value that's big? Louis? A big one. Oh, to reduce? Yes. Oh, you want a small one. You want a small one, right? So when you look on page 385, okay, you'll notice that air has a very, very, very small value of K. It's like 0 0.026. So this is why when you look at windows, they say, oh, the windows are a vacuum, okay? They'll put a vacuum in between those panes. Because if there's a vacuum in between those panes, then that thermal energy won't get transmitted as easily across there. Now, if it's just a piece of glass, here's the odd thing. Glass itself has a pretty high value of 0.75, okay? So glass itself actually transmits energy fairly easily. But if you have a piece of glass, a vacuum, and then another piece of glass, then that's going to mediate or reduce that energy flow across that barrier. Louis? Does that like airplane windows? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then how do we get joules per second on the right side of the equation? Where do seconds come from? Okay, what do you mean? Like on the bottom when you cancel all that out, you just get... Well, what, this is watts. Oh. And oh. watts are joules per second. I thought it was work. So this is, no, no, that's watts, because those are the no. units, not the variable. No, it's okay. Okay, cool. okay. It's okay. So on your assignment, and no, there's not a backside, and no, there's not even any problems from your book, okay? But you do need, you do need the, to work this last problem, you do need the data table that's on pre, page three to five. So if you just want to take a picture of that, so you have that if you don't want to drag your book home, okay? But anyway, all of these have to deal with what we've been talking about. Uh, so here we go. You're on your own. I know some Where's the homework?